We must now move on to questions to the Minister for Education, and we will start with listed questions. Question 1 and indeed question 4 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Mr Michael Duff. Question number 2, Cash Devere Duff. Uh, there continues to be a very strong performance with pupils here at both GCSE and A-levels, and it is important that we celebrate and acknowledge their achievements across uh, the North. We should not forget the teachers and parents who have supported these children to reach this stage in their education. In relation to GCSEs, we have seen the highest GCSE performance since the Joint Council for Qualification, Qualification figures first became available in 2002. There was 0.2 percentage points increase at A-star, from 8.7 per cent to 8.9 per cent. Grades A star to A all showed a 0.2 percentage points increase to 28.2 per cent. Grades A star to C increased by 1.5 percentage points to 78 percentage points. Uh, in relation to A levels, 83.7 per cent of entries at A levels here uh, achieved grades A star to C, a 0.2 point increase in last year. The overall pass rate remained much the same as last year, with 98.1 per cent of grades awarded A star to E. 7.3 per cent, previously 7.2 per cent of grades were awarded at A star. One of my top priorities as Education Minister continues to be raising standards. These results are very encouraging, but we cannot be complacent. There remains unacceptable levels of achievement gaps at all, uh, at all levels in our system, and I intend to do all that I can to tackle that. Mr. Michael Duff for supplementary. Uh, may I got, uh, I'll ask you, you thank uh, the Deputy Speaker and uh, the Minister there for his answer. Can I ask the Minister, is there any early indication that the signature project involving newly qualified teachers will have had any effect on results in 2013-2014? Um, well, uh, it's too early to tell that the signature project is and will go through an evaluation, which will give us a more informed uh, response to the members' questions and indeed to other questions, though I have no doubt, however, on uh, the generality of it. Additional resources in a school being put to proper use will assist young people in achieving their uh, exam outcomes. Call Mr. Mervyn Storey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I join the Minister in uh, welcoming the results this year in terms of, of the outcome for, for pupils. And I think it's an indication of, yet again, the quality of the educational provision uh, system in Northern Ireland. However, the Minister will be well aware that the gap between girls and boys is still an issue which is very prevalent. 37.6% uh, of boys not attaining uh, a GCSE C or above, compared to 21.4% of girls, and also in areas where there is the application of free school meals, which is worrying. Could the Minister maybe specifically tell the House what uh, actions he and his department would plan to take in regard to that issue of the gap, because he always refers to gaps in other sectors, but in terms of this gap between girls and boys, what specifically could be done to address that particular problem? It is a challenge which faces many education systems uh, across the world, the improving results of girls uh, compared to boys. I do believe, however, that we have an advantage within our education system where the flexibility of the curriculum allows the teacher in the classroom to adapt the teaching and the coursework to uh, the, requirements or the requirements of the students before them, including adapting it in such a way which makes those subjects interesting uh, and lift off the page to boys as well. But it is, it's, it's something we continue to work at. It's a challenge for us all. And as I said, it's a question that has been asked of education systems throughout the world. Call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank, thank the Minister for his answers. Could I ask the Minister what is his assessment of uh, the trends uh, regarding pupils taking Irish at, uh, at GCSE? And air level over the last number of years. I don't have the, the figures before me, and I'm happy to supply them uh, to the member in writing. 
We have, uh, over this last number of years, been seeking ways to improve uptake in terms of all the modern languages, including Irish. Uh, and I only recently signed off on uh, more funding for further studies into how we uh, encourage young people to take on another language, uh, as I say, including Irish. But I'm happy to share the exact figures with the member in red. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, what consultations are your department having with schools, principals, governors and the like regarding the future of GCSE and A-levels? Uh, and do you recognise that the importance of keeping our standards in line with those of the rest of the UK so, in fact, that equal status is afforded to the pupils? Um, throughout the process of change, which was originally initiated by Secretary of State for Education, Minister Gove, in his day, I have involved uh, in detailed discussion and consultation with the education sector. I, has, I established a, a working group uh, which involved educationalists, both from uh, my field and also from the further and higher education sector, the business sector, and others to study where we should go, move forward with our, our qualification system. Throughout that, they have engaged with the education sector and young people, uh, and a, a significant report was published, um, I think it was in around June time of, of this year, or maybe even earlier this year, uh, which set out a pathway which I have followed and made recommendations which I have followed. Uh, and that body is going to continue its work to look at the long term. Um, program of change, if required, to our qualification system. And core to that will be ensuring that our qualifications are recognised uh, throughout these groups of islands, and that there will be no, um, in, in no way, any of our young people will be disadvantaged if they choose to travel with those qualifications, whether it's for further higher education or employment. I call Mr. Roy Beggs for a question. Question number three. The most recent staffing survey across the education and library boards indicated there are 166 educational psychologists available across the five boards. All of the ALBs have recently reported that in the overwhelming majority of cases they are meeting their legislative target to complete the statutory assessment and statementing process within 26 weeks, subject to valid ex exceptions. In addition, my department continues to provide financial assistance each year in respect of the doctorate in educational child and adolescent psychology, courses at Queen's University, a course which provides an output of six graduates each academic year. In October 2013, the DCAP steering group discussed the need for an increase in the DCAP intake. However, after further discussions with CEOs of both the BELB and the SEELB, it was agreed that this would not be necessary. Call Mr. Beggs for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his, his answer, but would he not accept that a 26 week target is half a year of a child's education and is an unacceptable delay? And will he ensure that there are a, a much faster process and also that the multi agency uh, support team for schools, which is only available to some of uh, the young people in my constituency and some of the primary schools, will be, be, be available to everyone? so that everyone has the best opportunity to reach their full potential. Um, one of the reasons why I have been working through a, an education bill is to reduce the time scale, or uh, admittedly to 20 weeks, the maximum of 20 weeks, but I also want to ensure that the identification of special educational needs takes place much earlier, that there is a joint up response to the needs of a young person, and that those children who have to move forward to uh, the new statementing process will be identified much, much sooner, so therefore trying to avoid uh, any uh, damage being uh, inflicted upon their education uh, through delay of our recognition of the needs of that child. Well, Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister will be aware of the ever increasing number of youngsters with autism in our society. Um, is the Minister can, um, happy that his department has the resources for to ensure that every youngster with autism gets uh, the uh, treatment and education that it, they deserve at the earliest possible, rather than having to wait in ordinate times? No, I'm, I'm on record from coming into post that the Department of Education is underfunded and many of our services remain underfunded. While we have ring-fenced and protected 
uh, special educational needs and the resources going to special educational needs, I can assure you I would like to uh, inject further funding into them. One of the areas of increasing pressure upon education uh, is special educational needs uh, across the education and library boards. And indeed, during the most recent monitoring round, I made a bid for £10 million additional funding uh, for the very provision of special educational needs within those education and library boards. I was unsuccessful in that, uh, and that will continue to place further pressures on my department. But uh, I have never stated that the Department of Education is well resourced. We require further funding, uh, and we particularly require further funding for special educational needs. Call Mr. Mickey Brady. Colonel Mayer, uh, last Concordia, I thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister to outline any plans he currently has to bring forward special education needs legislation? Colonel Mayer. Yes, uh, as I said in, in response to one of the, your colleagues, uh, I am in the process of bringing forward legislation um, to the House in relation to special educational needs, which will see uh, significant changes as to how we deliver special educational needs, both in the classroom and at board level. Uh, I have spent considerable time working through the detail of that legislation. I welcome the input of the Education Committee. Uh, to the preparation of that legislation, and I intend to continue to work with the Education Committee in regards to that, because I am of the firm view that uh, no one wants to have a, a political spot over this bill, and we want to make sure that the bill is right and protects and enhances uh, the educational needs of our young people. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, g given that there is an increasing need for more effective interventions on the behalf of children with special education needs and the need to shorten the time between the referral and the first appointment with an education psychologist. Is it acceptable that in the last academic year, 2013-2014, there were 900 days lost to the education psychology service through retirement? Well, I, I do not have the, those exact details in front of me, but I, I refer you to my original answer uh, when in October 2013 there was a review carried out in relation to the number of child psychologists available to the boards and after discussions with senior executives from the boards it was decided that the training numbers that were currently going through the system were suffice uh, to meet demand at this time. Now, uh, that was in October 2013. That review was carried out. It's, it's working up towards a year from the uh, past. I am more than happy to return to the subject to ensure that uh, we are meeting the needs of our young people ahead of the introduction of the SEND Bill, which I think will see a significant uh, improvement of the delivery of special education needs service to our young people. Well, Mr. Paul Given for a question. Uh, question number four, Deputy or number five, Deputy Speaker. Uh, churches and religious bodies have a long history of involvement in education here as founders of schools, as transfers and as trustees. As such, they have made a significant and positive contribution over many years to our education system and, and continue through their involvement in boards of governors to shape the ethos of our schools and to play their part in helping every child reach his or her full potential. Given for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In light of what the Minister has said, would he like to take the opportunity to apologise uh, to the Protestant churches for what he said in an interview to the Belfast Telegraph that uh, they needed to step up to the mark around their social responsibilities in education, given the role that uh, churches have played, both uh, Protestant churches and uh, Roman Catholic churches? in establishing education in the first instance and the roles that they play as transferers uh, and boards of governors, uh, particularly in my constituency where I can see amongst working class uh, communities, young males, Protestants, the churches are to the forefront of trying to tackle education older achievement. Would he now want to apologise for the insult that he gave uh, to them? Well, I, I in no way insulted uh, the Protestant churches. And the members should not take the story from the lavish headlines uh, which news editors choose to print in their newspapers. I and the Protestant church leaders had a very interesting and informed debate uh, on one of the radio shows the Sunday morning after that. Uh, I explained to the church leaders present on air my views and off air my views in relation to their role. So I did not insult them during the interview, uh, either in the newspaper or on the airwaves afterwards. But I did listen to the member quite recently stating that uh, pillars 
of society and pillars of government and pillars of state are open to challenge, as are churches and church leaders are also open to challenge. And the challenge I put out to the Protestant churches, to the trade unions, to civic society and other opinion formers was that they need to take up the mantle of uh, challenging academic selection and the ills it brings to our education system and to our society. And I continue to put that challenge out to all churches and all other bodies therefore mentioned. Call Mr. Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far. But given the fact that the RE syllabus in Northern Ireland has been approved by the four main churches here, does the Minister recognise that there's a strong school of thought which suggests that any further religious instruction should be the responsibility of the individual church organisations, parents and guardians, and not the responsibility of schools? Um, well, the, the RE, RE syllabus is under review, uh, and there will be a report published in due course in relation to how we believe the teaching of RE should move forward. But as a society, uh, churches still play a significant role in the day-to-day -day lives of people. They play a significant role, as I already said, to Mr. Gervin in our education system. And uh, as it's currently laid out, um, religious education should be delivered within our schools. It should be contained within the ethos of the school, which is set by the Board of Governors. Uh, so there is significant autonomy for the Board of Governors to set that out. I believe that religious education, um, when delivered in a way which explores all the faiths, both Christian, Muslim, Judaism, and all the other faiths that are out there, allows young people to, to approach life from a more rounded position than simply uh, being taught one faith or, or the teachings of one faith. So, but it is a matter for the schools at this stage. But as I've also said, the RE syllabus is under review and will report it back in due course. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister uh, recognise the tremendous historic contribution by the churches right across the board, both Catholic and Protestant churches, to education in Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole? Uh, and the current contribution that the churches make uh, to education, and would the minister uh, uh, affirm that? I, I've never said otherwise, and I, I listened and I attended a very interesting lecture given by one of your colleagues, or one of your former colleagues, uh, Dr. Sean Foran, in Queens about a year ago, where he outlined the history of education on the island of Ireland, uh, and I have to say it was a very informative. Very interesting debate, and, and he touched on, as you would have to, giving that history, uh, the role of, of the various churches, uh, both pre-partition and since partition, and the, they, they clearly have played an important role in our education system. They will continue to play an important role uh, in our education system. But as I said to Mr. Gervin, church leaders are open to challenge, uh, and I reserve my right to challenge them, as they do challenge political leaders as well. And I think it, help, it, it assists a very healthy democratic society if civic leaders can challenge each other in a respectful manner, of which it was the manner in which I challenged the, the Protestant church leaders in relation to this subject. Call Lord Morrow for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number six, please. <clears throat> uh, I have negotiated strongly to protect the education from budget cuts in line with the protection of to health. I welcome the decision by the executive as part of June monitoring to protect my department from cuts. The future success of our economy and of society in general depends on there being a high quality education service that compete with the best internationally. Equally, all of our young people have the right to a quality education that enables them to reach their full potential. A right enshrined not only in our own legislation, but in the UN conventions on the right of the child. Following the outcome of the budget 2011-15, it was clear that it would need to make over £300 million of savings across the budget period to simply balance the budget. Whilst I sought to protect frontline services, it was necessary to initiate a series of strategic cost reduction exercises which have resulted in over 2,900 school and 450 non-school based redundancies. Although considerable efforts have been made to reduce the pressures on the education budget, 
The financial outlook continues to be very challenging, and I believe I can and have demonstrated a commitment to prudent budget management when maximising the uses of resources available to me. Call Lord Morrow for <coughs> supplementary. Well, uh, Speaker, I've heard what the Minister has said and he has uh, given a fair long answer. I'm not sure that he has given the answer that I would have liked to have heard. However, we'll try it another way. Is the Minister telling the House today that there will be no cuts as a result of the, the impact that his party has taken in relation to, to, to benefit cuts? Is he telling us today, no, there will be no cuts, the programme goes on as it was stated, and that, in fact, there will, these penalties will have no impact at all? I, I, I answered your question quite clearly. The executive voted to protect the Department of Education budget. I will continue to argue very, very strongly that that remains the case. And as I've said, and, and, and you should listen to the figures again, this is in the absence of anything to do with welfare. This is in the presence of Conservative Party economic policy towards this executive. 2,900 school-based redundancies, the majority of those being teachers, they're, they're lost to our education system. Lost. Now, these are not figures that have been produced to shock and produce shock and awe to the media and to the general public. These are real. These people have left education. They're no longer available to teach our young people, to assist our young people, or to uh, promote good education. And 450 non-school-based redundancies, they are support staff who work in the education and library boards uh, to assist and deliver education system as well. So the Department of Education has already suffered as a result of the Conservative Party's economic policy towards the executive. Now, what I'm saying is welfare cuts, and, you, and I note now you're referring them to as benefit cuts because that's exactly what they are. It's nothing to do with reforms. It's cuts to people's living standards will have an impact across, across the North. But as far as education is concerned, and I welcome the fact that the executive has said, no, we are protecting our education system against any further, and I emphasize the term, <coughs> further cuts. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. Um, can I ask the Minister to outline how Westminster cuts to the Black Grant have affected his ability to oversee a fit-for-purpose education budget and the educational opportunities of our young people? Go on, Mungut. Just a good question, Jim. Well, as I said at the outset, uh, when I took over post in 2011, the education budget was short from its previous budget, which was not by any means fit for purpose, £300 million pounds down. I had to secure savings of that amount. I, I, in late 2011, went to both the First and Deputy First Minister and the then Finance Minister. I outlined to them in very, very graphic terms the type of education system we would end up with if we had to continue with the £300 million worth of cuts. I, I, I had that conversation in 2011. The Finance Minister, the First and Deputy First Minister, recognised that the education system could not cope with the scale of cuts that were envisaged, and they secured an additional £120 million for my department over the next rolling years. That has ensured that the job losses aren't in the region of 4,000 in our schools. That has ensured that the non-teaching staff, or at least 1,000, haven't lost their posts. But while understandably there has been a significant debate around the impact of welfare cuts, it's the economic policy towards the executive by the Conservative government which is having the most detrimental impact. Uh, in 2009, the block grant was £10 billion. Uh, the, that term block grant sort of sticks in my throat because it suggests we don't pay taxes. In 2014, the block grant is £10 billion. That means we're having to deliver our services at the same le at, with the same money we had in 2009. So while welfare cuts are significant, the economic policy being directed towards this is having the greatest impact. Well, Mr. Cathal Washin for a question. I was pleased with the response to the call for expressions of interest for the Shared Education Campuses programme and was able to announce the first three successful projects to be supported in July. 
The Western Education Library Board has advised that it is working with CCMS on both Lima Valley High School and St Mary's High School in preparing a business case uh, to move the project forward. Call Mr. Washington for supplementary. Uh, could I ask the Minister for an overview of the shared campus programme, uh, which was recently announced, and if the programme is indeed on schedule? Um, well, we had initially hoped to start off with 10 projects. Uh, while there was a significant interest in the projects or in the programme with around 16 applications, only three at this stage meet the criteria. However, we have been in correspondence with all unsuccessful projects, and my department will be having conversations with them as well as to how they can move their projects on to the next stage. So it is a start, and I think it is a good start. For instance, the St Mary's Lima Valley and Lima Valley High School uh, proposal, where well, there is a number of uh, MLAs visited the, the, the project earlier on, along with the chair of the Education Committee. And th those are two schools, like many other schools, have been inv involved in shared education for many, many years. This was a natural progression for the actual placing of, of shared accommodation. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to support that, as with the other projects as well. And I have no doubt that when we go out to a call for further and expressions of interest uh, for further shared education campuses, we will have as equally a supportive um, return from our schools. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey for a question. Question eight, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I am committed to the continuous improvement of careers education in schools through the implementation of the joint DE and DEL career strategy, preparing for success. It was always planned that this strategy would be reviewed in 2014, and this work is well underway. Minister Forey and I have been able to ensure that the key issues raised with the Committee for Employment and Learning inquiry report are integrated within the terms of reference for the review. The aim of the review is to ensure that everyone has access to high quality careers education, information, advice and guidance, and is supported in the development of good career decision making skills. The career review is being conducted by an independent panel that includes representatives from industry, schools, colleges of further education and universities. The review will conclude in the autumn when the independent panel will put forward their recommendations to me and to Minister Forey for our consideration. Well, Mr. Ramsey for <coughs> supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. The Minister would be aware of the amount of time and investment that the Employment and Learning Committee put on in a very intensive way looking at careers guidance. Could the Minister assure the House as best he can that in going forward that we will have in place the most consistent, accurate best practice and, as he says, high-quality provision ensuring that our young people going forward in careers are given the best advice? Well, I, I certainly assure you that is what we aim for. Um, and I think that the, the review we have put in place in the terms of reference we have put in place and the committee report, which is a significant uh, resource to that review, will allow us certainly to uh, significantly improve our careers advice uh, moving forward. It's, it's a big ask for me to guarantee it, uh, but I certainly, my, my, uh, my approach to this is that we need to significantly improve upon the improvements which have been achieved in our careers advice strategy, and we need to give our young people the most up-to-date careers advice and opportunities as possible moving forward. And we will achieve that uh, in collaboration, and I think in terms of the, the, the people we have brought together and who they represent. And that careers review is important because we will receive that through collaboration between schools, business, universities, and the most important, in my opinion, careers advisors out there, parents. We have to inform them to ensure that they are aware of the most uh, up-to-date careers advice that is possible as well. Call Mr. Jerry Kelly for a question. I go back to last from Coria, uh, Kest Everendy. Question nine, please. Following discussions with elected representatives Karen Lee Cullen and the member himself and the parents and pupils of the, on the issue of support for pupils in North Belfast to attend College of First Year, I have made available a grant to the school. The grant is to be used for the purpose of removing transport barriers for some pupils attending the school, primarily those for whom public transport or other transport services are not readily accessible. The grant will be available for three years to give the Board of Governors of College of First a time and space to actively engage with TransLink and other transport providers to establish a long-term solution to the transport needs of pupils attending the school, with a view to the grant no longer being required. 
Uh, to assist pupils, TransLink has already agreed to put on a diesel route from the north to west Belfast each morning. This route has been operational since the start of the term, and I understand that it is well used by many college to first year pupils. The grant will be reviewed after three years, but it may also be subject to change earlier. If following the outwork of the independent review of home to school transport, any changes are made to home to school transport policy, which have a significant impact, impact on the transport arrangement for pupils attending college to first year. Pray there isn't time for a supplementary because time is up. And we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Mr. Beggs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In, in times of difficult financial budgets, uh, shared education facilities can bring about uh, economic benefits, but I believe they are uh, equally important that they are beneficial uh, to young people and, and to communities. So, would the Minister advise what progress there has been? Uh, in encouraging shared educational facilities which might benefit uh, the children within my constituency of East Anglia. Minister. Uh, thank you. We, we, I outlined in, in, during the previous question session how we are contributing to the physical character of shared education in terms of the provision of campuses and facilities for schools. And I believe in the coming days the OFM DFM will be making a significant announcement in relation to how we can contribute towards uh, the resources required for schools to carry out shared education as well. Mr Beggs for supplementary. Uh, in the past, uh, there was a significant opportunity to uh, promote shared educational facilities when uh, the, the then uh, St Congles College and Lauren High School had a close working relationship with shared classes and children being exchanged from each, each, each schools. But sadly, uh, uh, the decision was made to amalgamate three schools within the maintained sector and to transport uh, those children some 17 miles outside of the town. Uh, so my question, Minister, uh, in the future, will one uh, educational sector's uh, priorities trump that of the people of Northern Ireland? And how do we try and ensure that we have the best system to suit everyone and to maximise the opportunities that exist? Well, I, I suspect the answer to your question will be answered by each member differently, depending on which sector they're talking about. Uh, I believe that shared education can be a significant driver to changing attitudes within our society and improving the educational outcomes of our young people. Um, both within area planning, shared education is there, and part of uh, the terms of reference to the different participants within that. But I think we're, we're, we're currently at a stage within shared education where I think it would be a mistake to impose solutions upon whether it's communities or sectors. I believe we have a role to encourage and to nudge, perhaps, them along the road. But I think at this stage in the journey, if we were to impose solutions upon sectors or communities, then the concept is doomed to failure. But as I've said in, in also in previous answers, there are many, many schools out there involved in shared education programs on a daily basis, who have been doing so quietly for many, many years and have been leaders uh, in this program. So, yes, there is a central role for government to play in this, there is a central role for the Department of Education and the Minister to play for this, but I, I do believe at this stage encouragement will reap more benefit than imposing solutions upon people at this stage. Call Mr. Alex Easton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister is he any updates on the proposed new capital bills for Priory College and Hollywood Primary School in Hollywood? Um, I'm aware of the proposals, uh, and they also relate to Hollywood Nursery School as well. It is also in, in the loop in this. They were not successful during the last round of capital announcement. That does not mean they will not be successful in the future. Call Mr. Easton for a supplementary. Could I uh, thank the Minister for his answer? Could I ask the Minister, could he explain to uh, the House what schools, what's the criteria that schools are chosen and what type of order are they chosen for capital new builds? How do the, his department process who gets and who doesn't? Um, uh, I have published uh, the criteria uh, on the Department of Education's website and I'm more than happy to make it available to the member in relation to how we choose. Uh, schools for capital announcements. Uh, there is a scoring mechanism against which schools are scored. Uh, and as no doubt any minister or any member of the House would like to be able to stand up and announce uh, more schools for capital announcements, I have to match it against my budget. 
and I have been conscious of since I came into office. Um, there have been many, many schools said to me, well, we were promised a build in 2003, 2004, 2005, and it never materialised. And I have been conscious not to make it. I have consciously made a decision not to announce long lists of schools that may never be built. I have announced small numbers of schools at a time to ensure that we can move them through the process quite quickly and get them built. And when I talk about quickly, I'm talking it may take two or three years to get them to the stage of actually diggers being on the ground. Uh, so I don't intend to go down the road to making lengthy lists available of schools that may be built sometime in never, never time. I will return to capital bills in the new year. I will examine very closely the case for the three schools you mentioned, and they will be judged against the criteria which I have had to establish, because I do not have enough money to build all the schools that are required. Call Mr Barry for a question. Can I ask the Minister uh, if he is in a position to say at this stage how many students from the north have progressed to higher education institutions in the south this summer, you know, both universities and institutes of technology? Um, I am not in a position to make those figures available to you, and I suspect that some of those figures may actually fall under the remit of Dale. But I do welcome uh, the announcement by Trinity College that they are going to review their entry criteria because they are entry criteria actually discriminated against pupils from the north because of the way they scored, uh, which made it virtually impossible for our our young people to gain access to Trinity. I welcome the work of Dublin's, uh, Dublin City University, who have been very, very proactive in this matter, and I believe you have a friend or a connection there. Uh, so uh, that they have been very, very active in relation to this matter, as have other uh, uh, further education and universities in the South. Uh, so I don't have the figures in front of me, Mr. Michael Duff, but if I have them available, I will share them with you. Call Mr. Michael Duff for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister to detail efforts uh, made in recent years to remove barriers to access for students from the north going to universities in the south and vice versa? I do understand that both Minister O'Dowd and Minister Farry have been involved in this work, but what more can be done? What more can be done to increase this student flow? Well, it has been raised at the highest levels of government, and indeed it was a regular topic on the North South Ministerial Council plenary sessions and educational uh, sector uh, meetings as well. And we have shifted uh, Trinity and others to a position where they are now openly reviewing this matter because they, are, they want to have students from the North within their schools. They see it as very, very important in terms of the mix within their universities. They have, they have students from all over the world, but very, very few from the north, and they recognise that as just nonsensical, and they need to, they need to do something about it. Uh, we, I have met and engaged with uh, senior university representatives from the south, and I have made the case very strongly to them. Uh, and I also note now that, um, for instance, Dublin City University sponsors a careers guidance uh, conference every year now for careers uh, guidance teachers. And they're making their presence very, very much felt at all these fairs where students are being given advice on their future educational pathways. I have, in terms of any review of our qualification system, I have ensured that any changes we make to our qualification systems does not disqualify any young person bringing those qualifications to any part of these islands, and that includes the South. Call Mr. Michael Majumsi for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I refer to the amalgamation of three primary schools in the inner South Belfast, Blythefield, Dun Donegal Road, and Fane Street. And the proposal, which has been now sitting on the books for some ten years, which was blocked by the minister's predecessor for four years, uh, and now after three and a half years of the minister sitting in his position, could I ask when are these inner city communities? Sandy Road, Donegal Pass, the Village and Lisburn Road see a proper investment in educational facilities for their children. Um, I, I don't accept the term blocked by either myself or my predecessor. The responsibility for planning and control of states in Belfast lies in the first instance with the Belfast Education Library Board. The board has advised my department that it is liaising with the Department of Health and Social Services and Public Safety in this matter, and the potential site of the Belfast City Hospital complex remains available for the proposed New South Belfast Primary School. The board has also confirmed that it has identified two other potential sites. All three will be assessed in an economic appraisal in order to determine the preferred option. 
capital investment in the new school cannot be considered by my department without a development proposal to amalgamate the three schools. The Belfast Board will have to publish a proposal, which I will then consider carefully following the statutory consultation process. However, to date, no such proposal has been published by the Board. Mr. Mr. Jimsey, for a Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. For four years, the Belfast Education and Library Board sought permission to spend £16,000 on a planning feasibility, and that was blocked by the Minister's predecessor, uh, and it was refused to be allowed. And that only was freed up once your predecessor uh, left office. Can I also say that the Belfast Education and Library Board regard this as a high priority capital project and asked the Minister. Uh, almost a year ago to include this on his capital list of capital priorities, and the Minister has failed to do so uh, in, in his June announcement. And I repeat the question, because he keeps telling this House how concerned he is for working-class Protestant children from, the, from disadvantaged communities. When are the children of Sandy Row, Donegal Pass, the village area and the Lisburn Road going to get a proper investment? Uh, in their education, in their primary school, instead of this continual year after year prevarication and delay. Well, the member is quite literally barking up the wrong tree. If he wants to bark and make uh, speeches, he needs to go make them to the Belfast Education and Library Board. How many times have I to repeat myself? The Belfast Education and Library Board is responsible for the controlled sector within Belfast. It needs to publish a development proposal. That's the next step. So that's where you need to go. Urge them to publish a development proposal. And I can assure the member that if the development proposal is approved, I will Order, move please. to ensure that young people. Sorry, the Minister, that resume his seat. Sorry. Members, I told you earlier, are not to make remarks across the floor. Uh, I've lost my chain of thought now. Um, if a development proposal is published and if it is approved, I can assure the member I will follow up with capital investment. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? Uh, Minister, what efforts are being made to safeguard and enhance school engagement uh, programmes with FE colleges? Um, well, I, I assume the member is referring to the entitlement framework, uh, which involves our colleges and funding, which has been attributed to our post primary schools. And I think this year it's to the value of around £4.5 million. Pounds. Previous years there's been £9 million. Pounds. It will depend on uh, the budget resettlement for 15-16, how much, if any, I can um, attribute to this, this programme. Our schools have been planning for the entitlement framework since, I think, 2006. They have been told constantly that it will, has to be a core part of their, their work and in terms of a core part, part of their budget moving forward. I have facilitated additional monies over this last number of years. I don't know if I'll be able to facilitate additional monies in coming years. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I kind of thank the Minister again? But how does the Department monitor the level of service provided within area learning communities, and how are examples of good practice disseminated within other learning communities? Well, the area learning communities um, have been, where they work together, have been very, very successful. And only recently, my permanent secretary visited them all and, and involved himself in detailed discussions with them around uh, their work and their, how we share best practice. Uh, best practice can be disseminated both within the area learning community and throughout area learning communities, both by the personnel involved and indeed uh, through my department or the Education and Library Boards or CCMS, um, whoever is the best conduit to do that. I think area learning communities are one of the success stories of our education system. They have ensured that schools have been able to engage with other educators. And as simple as that may sound, our, our educators are very, very busy. And when we bring them together in a format such as the area learning communities, it allows them to think outside the box quite literally, or think outside their schools quite literally, and share best practice across the board. And indeed, I hope to be in a position to put in place a pilot scheme where I'm going to involve primary schools in area learning communities as well. Order time is up. 